been here before uh, later on today uh, if you get a chance you can look around and you can answer questions and, and talk to you about what we do here but most of us are here for a particular reason to see a particular person and to have an experience thinking about hip-hop at different levels of what it means what it means that we're talking about it at Harvard what it means that everyone in the world talks about it and what it means in terms of how we all got here in the first place. Um, I'm Marcelia Morgan. I'm the founding director of the Hip Hop Archive. And I'd like to introduce you to those of uh, us who will be in dialogue. Um, first, Alvin Benjamin Carter, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the Hip Hop Archive. Uh, so we're here today. Um, yeah, you should sit on the end. We're here today in this room with a decent that sound system and in many ways trying to figure out how to be at Harvard and keeping it hip hop uh, because of the insight of uh, Alvin Carter. So I want to publicly thank you for having stuck with us for years. You know. Yeah. What is that Drake line? In terms of Just one, the, the Started at the bottom. Started, started, <laughs> started, bottom started outside, you know, it's just like, you know, real bottom. Believe me, it's been, it's, it's been an interesting history uh, and a good one. And, um, you know, hip hop all the way. So, Alvin, so he's our innovation director. And as far as I'm concerned, that's his claim to fame, but I'll read a little more about him. Okay. Um, he um, is a DJ producer known as Data Black, an entrepreneur, and he's in third year law at Northeastern University and uh, will be, of course, uh, graduating this year and will never work for us free again. <laughs> he's been the joint teaching and research assistant for both intellectual property and community business clinics focusing on copyrights, trademarks, and entertainment law. Currently, uh, he's a uh, research assistant at the Center for Law, Innovation, and Creativity. Um, as Harvey's innovation director, he plays a key role in the Classic Crates project, collaboration with Ninth Wonder and the Harvard's Lowe Music Library. He continues to serve in the role while in law school. He also continues to produce music and DJ events in the greater Boston area. He has over two decades of guitar experience and almost as much beat production experience. Um, through, though passionate about his craft, Alvin will become an IP and corporate law associated, uh, associate at an international law firm based in Boston. I'm cutting down the reading of some of these so we can get to our uh, um, e event. Randall Sycamore Medford. You could come forward and. <coughs> as the new generation's favorite A&R person, and there's a reason for that, yes? He's worked with artists like Travis Scott and YG, among many others, at where his A&R smarts helped yield gold and platinum results. And throughout, and throughout his 10-year career in the music business, he has always focused on the culture. A quote from him in his complex interview, you know how they all always have that term for the culture? I understand it but there's never been a point in my life where it's not been for the culture. After holding 10 years at Atlantic Records, Def Jam, and Epic, uh, Epic Records, Sycamore is the Senior Vice President of A&R and Creative Director at Interscope Records. He is actively involved in pushing forward the hip hop culture in various capacities with the mission of teaching the fundamentals of artistic discovery and development and empowering the creative superstars of tomorrow. He likes being dope, and he is here today to do just that. <laughs> so we're, we're going to spend at least a half hour, probably, in just a discussion, uh, 
and some things that we've been talking about and uh, wanting to share with you and think about, and then we'll open it up also to discussion in any way you might want to do it. All right. All right. All right. And I wanted just to start off with uh, what uh, I uh, told, said to uh, Sigmore that I have a question and it involves Beyonce. <laughs> okay. Except it isn't a Beyonce question per se, it's a business question. And it involves a story. A number of years back, uh, I was staying at a hotel in Los Angeles. Uh, I was living in, I think, in Northern California at the time. And I was in the bar um, waiting to meet someone there. And there were two young white men in the bar. And they were obviously a and guys. And they ordered. How did you know they were A&R And they ordered a bottle of champagne. And the reason why I paid attention to them is because I was, I was thinking, that's that champagne, you know, and so I was looking at the bottle that was going, and I was thinking, what are they doing drinking this pink champagne, and, you know, and they're so, you know, they're toasting each other, and so I listened to what they were talking about, and they were toasting the success of the talent's career, they referred to the person as the talent, and when they started talking, one of them looked at me, um, and they both understood that I was, you know, a non-person in their world or something like that. And they went back, and the talent was Beyonce. And it was the success of her solo career. And they referred to her as though she was some sort of trained, you know, um, creative person. It wasn't that it was negative. It was, it was just that, from their perspective, she was money and that they had made all this money and had managed to do it, I think they said they were 25 years old or something like that, and had managed to do it, and that they were laughing at about how much more they had than she had, that her agent had, it was this bizarre detailed discussion in front of someone that they assumed, you know, was nobody, and, you know, in many respects that's true, but, it just so happens I was at that time the director of hip hop archive and was there to meet somebody, an artist as well. And it was something that I was riveted to because I knew exactly what he was talking, they were talking about in terms of detail. So my question to you is how do you manage A and R people and what would you say to them um, if they were actually working within your office and you knew that that discussion had happened? Um, there's different kind of A&R people. You know, a lot of times when I was like, when I started off, I really hated A&R. You know, when I first got my first couple of jobs, was, all my experiences were, were negative. You know, when I first got my first like internship A&R job with Just Blaze, I found like this artist side on and they got the record deal, then you know they shifted me out the money, and I got another job at 21 and Atlantic Records, and then I didn't like that role either because I was just fine beats for other A&R guys, and they would kind of all take credit for it, and my ideas weren't getting over it. So by the time I was 23, I was like, man, I this, like <laughs> going to the streets, you know. I went to the artist development firm, and I told myself I, I wouldn't do A&R again. But after being in the streets for a few years, I thought about it, and I was like, you know what? Maybe this ain't no thing isn't as bad, but I'm going to do it my way, you know? So I'm going to do it, and I'm going to be respectful to artists. I'm going to be artist-based. And all my wins come with artist wins. So I'm never going to be up here defending what other ain't artists do, how they move, how they act, how they talk, because I don't like most of myself, you know? But I, I, what I would say is, like, the way I went, and my success for the second part of my career has been based on my artist vouching for me and my success with the artist. You know, and it really starts with like common goals, you know? So like when I was working with somebody like YG, uh, there's always a problem that you have to solve, you know? And when I met him, he wasn't just on the street corner, like, you know what I mean? Looking for a deal. He had a record deal already, but he was really localized in LA, you know? 
and people thought like, oh, this guy will never make it out of Los Angeles, you know? So it's like your task is just to get an album done so you can be put out this December, you know? And then we'll probably drop him after. That was like, because he's local. And I was like, no, I'm not gonna accept that, you know? And the new goal was like, how do we break this guy national? So we went, came up with the idea to record in Atlanta. We had the um, Young Jeezy was our mentor out there. You know, he really showed us how to really craft the record. And um, we ended up getting a hit record that started in Atlanta, in my you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and um, and uh, it really broke, and that was like my first hit record. And that was his first big record after a record that didn't really represent his career, a song called Two to the Booty. Because it was like, oh, this is Two to the Booty guy, you know? And I, I, I needed to change that. So then we had another hit record with Booty Love, and then by the time the album came out, you know, actually the album got leaked, we were in South by Southwest in Austin. And he was like, oh, yo, yo, sick, the album's leaked, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Twitter, and you know, like, I had like tears in my eyes, I'm so happy, you know what I mean, that like people were responding well to it, you know, everybody's doing these memes and these tweets and these things, and you know, it, it was almost like, uh, it was like a come to Jesus moment for me, you know what I mean, it's that when, when his album came out, you know what I mean? So I, I, I would just, you know, that just gives you like, that's just one album, you know what I mean? Like we go so deep in, it's like, to me, it's like winning a championship. You see those guys on the floor holding a basketball, crying, throwing champagne on each other. I would, I would never be in a place toasting without my artist, because I'm in it with my artist. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it wouldn't make sense to me to be toasting without Travis, without YG, because we're a team, we did it together. And those people, um, I can tell you all know who they are, but they're not gonna last longer than Beyonce. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> and, that, and, that's, and that's why, you know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, the talent is the one that drives it. You know what I mean? The person who got me my job at Insco with Travis, he introduced me to uh, Lucy and Grange, who's the uh, head of all Universal Music Group. And he's, he has a meeting, like, yo, he's like, he's like, Travis, you have this energy, but who's going to run your label? He's like, Sycamore, Sycamore's going to do it. You know what I mean? And he was about, she got me my last job at Epic, vouching me with L.A. Reid. So I, I, I think that's a very short-sighted approach. And I think that if you don't have respect in the artist community, or for artists, you just don't last that long. So I hope, hope they didn't pay for that champagne. You know? <laughs> <laughs> a question for you about the creativity of the artist. And it's a hard thing to wrangle, but it seems to be that you have systems and plans. Can you discuss how you go about taking a, a concept and, and really pushing it, like how being an A&R can be more than finding the there, what's the next level to, to do? Um, was anybody here last night at the other talk? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll give like a reworded, but a little more in, you know, in-depth answer. So the first, the first part is you have to lock in with an idea. You know what I mean? Like you working on the album, album. You know what I mean? You're like yo, man, like I'm trying to, try and change the world with this record. You know what I mean? I really want to put Boston on the map. You know what I'm saying? But I want to do it in a way that's not the street. I want to be globally. You know what I mean? we come up with a concept that we lock in on. It's similar to being like a personal trainer. I want to lose 15 pounds for this summer. But we need to, me and you need to lock in on what we're doing every day. And after we lock in on that concept, then that's our bond. More important than going out, hanging out in the studio, we need to go and grab that goal. And how you end up there might change. The name of the album might change. But that ethos, that, that texture, that, that concept, doesn't really change. And we're locked in until that album comes out. Whether the album comes out in six months, 12 months, two years, we fight, we hate each other. We're gonna have to lock in, and that's the role I play. You see what I'm saying? Uh, with the artists, you know? And, uh, so I'm like the, uh, I'm trying to manage all things creative on the music side. Cause they have people like, you know, like you were saying, like the booking agent who's focused on getting shows or, the publishing person is focused on getting the songs in different places. My role is the music, the track list, songs, features, lyrics, songwriting, everything that you hear, every intricacy, the beat drop, everything. That's my role and I gotta protect them because in my role, I can't make you look stupid because I'm the number one person. I'm the trainer, I'm the person telling you like, okay, go da 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 da. So you have to trust me that this art that you're doing that you won't put out will be whack. <laughs> You know what I mean? And that, that 
it's a, it's a, I take that responsibility really, um, it's a big responsibility because somebody's really entrusting you with their life. You know, because if it comes out and if people don't like it, then when you go from there, it hurts your confidence in this whole thing. It's about having that confidence. You work that hard to, to have it. You know, you've seen a boxer when he loses that confidence. You've seen a baseball player when he can't hit the ball anymore. It's, you lose it. It's just, it's confidence is fragile. So I have to make sure that your confidence is up. So it makes me think of something, um, you mentioned features, but just in general, um, moving around through the industry, going to different places, is it difficult to manage relationships when you're moving around or artists on different labels and giving features? And how do you navigate that? It seems like, you know, more than just plays, you're going to have an interscope. Um, are there nuances to that that people might not see? Yeah, the feature game is tricky. You know, people just think, like, I got, I, people come up to me all the time, like, yo, I got $20,000, I got $50,000, can you get so-and-so on a record for me? And the person might take the money, but then they probably won't clear it. Or they'll take the money and give you like a really BS verse, you know what I mean? The best relationships come with either people really like each other, you can tell in the music, or you have a really, really great song that you want somebody on. So the trick about having relationships is to use them when they're right. Because you don't want people, you want people every time you pick up, they call you, you call them, they know like, oh, six calling me, like I gotta, I gotta pick this up, it's gonna be some shit. It's gonna be dope. If I call them about BS features all the time, the label's like, yo, can you get this on this uh, on this pop album, this pop record? Can you get Travis in this? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Curve. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not doing it because if I come to him with that and he starts associating me with whack music, it, you know, it's like uh, it's the, my, 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 my stock goes down a little bit in that creative community to the point where my word doesn't mean anything because now I'm known for bringing out whack stuff. But every time I come with an idea and something, it's like, better and it's cool and it works and my stock's up. You know what I mean? It's a it's not a it's, no one gets an even playing field in this shit in this creative stuff. You know what I mean? You gotta be you gotta be dope all the time. And every time you do something whack, I really gotta pay my rent, I really gotta do this job, or I gotta do this flyer, do this verse for this artist I don't like. My sales be I know nobody's gonna hear it. Somebody's gonna hear it. Someone's gonna see your name involved. Or you can do something ill later, then it go back over. You was whack before, like you know what I mean? <laughs> You got it. It's this whole your whole life is one giant um, resume. You know what I'm saying? And, and they, they're gonna look back at everything you did. They're gonna look back at stuff you did in college, stuff you did in high school. When you go to the museum, they're gonna go back and they say, "This is the first drawings he ever made. This is the first demo you ever had." So just try to try to do the best of your ability all the time, so you can just sit back and be proud of everything you did. You know. Another question for you. What was your most fun project? And I know that may be hard because there are projects out there, but what was the most fun as far as getting into the details of, and, and also enjoying the end product? But where did you really find that you get a stride? YG is my crazy life album, right? And it's because it was the first time that I started thinking about like different. I got the NR side different, but I never put out, I never led a project before. You know, so you got these guys, um, really young and multiple, you know what I mean? As far as like YG, he was really listening. DJ Mustard, he's in his prime in his joint, you know what I'm saying? And I'm just there like, okay, cool, I might not ever get to make an album again on this level. So the process was, we went to Atlanta, because every time we record in LA, anybody from LA? So I don't know about LA, LA is like, has different cultures, right? Mm -hmm. LA has like the hipster culture, you know, that's like Silver Lake, downtown, Echo Park. As like the skater culture, you know what I mean? You know, the Vans, Fairfax. As like the stoner culture, right? You know, hippies, chill, dude, you know what I mean? It's sativa, man, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which that kind of goes with the beach culture, you know what I mean? Um, it has the Hollywood culture, you know, most people associate with LA, which is really just like the Valley, Hollywood, Beverly Hills. And then there's the gangbang culture. It's a whole nother culture. So every time you go to the studio, it's like, you know, whoop de whoop de so and so, whoop de whoop, you gotta call in and check in with so and so, and da 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 da, and I'll be like that for eight hours. Every time. So we get a half a verse done in eight hours of gang politics. Every single time. So I'm like, listen, dude, we can't record it no more. <laughs> Where you won't go. <laughs> so I'm like, so we gotta go to Atlanta. You know what I mean? There's a lot of producers there we could work. So we all we moved to Operation to Atlanta. We got our corporate apartments, right? I was on the second floor, he's on the fourth floor, my sister's on the third floor. And we worked a schedule, we worked a routine, you know what I'm saying? 
6 to 6, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., we go to the studio, Monday through Thursday. Friday to Sunday, we say, you know what, we're not gonna record, you know what I mean? We're gonna take and live life and get some energy. So every day we go to the studio, like clockwork, we get there about 6, 6.15, we leave the studio between 5 and 6, we go home, go to Chick-fil-A, go home, <laughs> rest, meet back up like around 2 o'clock, talk about what we did the last night, like the business, you know what I'm saying? We talk about the songs, where they fit, so forth. In the meantime, I didn't really like Atlanta at the time, it was a little slow for me. So I just got a movie list and I just watched this whole movie list, like 50 movies. And I would just rent the movies and watch them on my iPad and my laptop. And I got so obsessed with movie structure, like Joseph Campbell's Hero Theory and all these different movies and I just got obsessed with it. That's like, let's make it like a movie like Kendrick, you know what I mean? So everything, the whole, the whole album is full of storytelling. So the reason that was my favorite album is because I got the chance to, you know, make a movie. You know what I'm saying? In a sense, like every song was like a little itty bitty movie. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just want to party, you know what I mean? DPT, like it's all telling different stories. And the best, the best part of music is storytelling. Because the best part about any, transferring any kind of idea is storytelling. If you think about all time, the things that go from generation to generation are stories. You know what I mean? So that, that was the reason I liked that album the best because I had the most creative input in that one. Another question is, so you clearly just, you know, you have a knack for this, but like, for folks who don't know, a lot of folks who probably do know, but how did you know you were going to get into the music industry? Because we kind of know when you started, you know, you had the mixtape thing going, did it big, but when did you know that that's what you were going to actually run with? It wasn't just a hustle, it was a career. Well, I, I was in high school and I used to sell mixtapes to teachers and to students, right? And I used to do like these custom tapes, right? And it's like 2001, 2002, so it's like the Napster era, Kaza and all that type of stuff. I don't know if you guys remember that shit. But it was like, you could download stuff and it had like turntable mixers, so I could burn these CDs and people would make me uh, a list and I'll DJ them and give them back the CDs. And one time my friend Jonathan, he was like, yo, you could just do one CD and put it out. You know, so it was right, right before, like right after like 9-11. So I called it Anthrax on Wax, right? Because Anthrax was big at the time, it sent a little powder in the mail, it was crazy. And then um, I made 25 copies, and he said, you just go to Canal Street, and I'll show you two places to sell them. So I went to Canal Street, I sold 10 copies, got $25, and then I went to downtown Brooklyn, I sold 15 copies for uh, another 250 each, so like $37.50, I guess, you know what I mean? And I went home, and I was like, okay, cool, like, this something today, you know? And I got a call the next day from the store downtown Brooklyn, like, yo, man, you see these all sold out, can you bring 100, you know? And at the time, the CD burner that I had at my dad's house only burned one every 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me about three days to fulfill the order. You know what I mean? I had to go to like Nobody Beats the Wiz. Yeah. You know what I mean? I had to go and download and burn these CDs. I didn't go to school for the next couple of days. And I finally brought the order. And when I got there, the guy's like, yo, where were you? I needed this shit two days ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I made up an excuse like, oh, you know, my printer in the Bronx, you know, just didn't work, you know what I mean? Da, 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 da. Like, you know, distributor or whatever. Because I was trying to like pose like I was this big time guy, but I was just me in high school and the number on the back of the CD was my house phone because I didn't have a cell phone, you know? <laughs> and uh, he gave me $250. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm in business. And from there, I just, that was, that was on. Because I didn't have any friends in the music business. You know, I didn't have any real prospects. The only school I could get into at that time was Hunter College, because I got over 1,100 in the SAT, but I was like a C student. You know, so I was like, okay, cool, this, this is my route. So I started buying more CDs, making more copies. 20 CDs turned to 40, 100 turned to 200, 200 turned to 400, got a distributor. And then in about a few months, I was moving about 2,000 CDs uh, a week. And by about the same time next year, I started moving about 5,000 CDs, like, no, it's 2,000 CDs a month. And then next year I was moving like 5,000 CDs a month and 10,000 CDs a month. And it was just like, every day it was just an adventure because I was just like, oh, this is crazy. Like, you know what I mean? I'm getting hot. Like I'm 18, I'm 19, I'm just like, the whole world is like, woo, you know what I mean? And me and these people, it, it, it was just a wild ride back then. Because I, I didn't know where I was going. I was just, just going with the flow. And mixtapes were hot, I was getting hot. I was just going with it. And that's when I was, and then one day somebody was like, you know, you should think about doing a and &R. I'm like, you're right. Like, what's an A&R? <laughs> <laughs> he said, like, an a &R, you know? Like, you book the sessions, you know what I mean? You can find talent. So there's this, this store called B Street Records. 
they uh, lived downtown Brooklyn and they gave me a job to be an A&R and they paid me, um, I think it was either $600 a week or every two weeks. And they made, built me an office, right? There was a girl named Unique Rodriguez, she became my girlfriend, right? And it was like, that was my role. And I, you know, DJ Clark Kent was the A&R before there. And he kind of put me on his wing and he would just come and just give me like advice at the time. And he's like an OG DJ A&R, this crazy legend. And I was just like 18 years old. And I was like, I like this A&R thing. <laughs> I started going to the studio. Then um, as I started getting hot in the mixtapes, I started like getting more relationships. So, you know, when you're coming up, you got to use, you, when, you, when, you, when you're going to come up, you be having like whatever your plug is, you got to like abuse it. You know what I'm saying? Like you might know one person who can get like sneakers early, but then you become the sneaker plug. Or you might not have anything you got, you just got to use that. So I had like free clothes from this thing called Unique Sports. They had like these patches, these NBA patches on the clothes, and I got a plug with them, right? So I got $7,500 from them to give clothes away as like an influencer or whatever. So I met Just Blaze, and I was like, yo, I can give you like two boxes of clothes. So I went to meet him. On, <laughs> I went to meet him on the Rock and Mike tour. I gave him all the clothes I had. I literally gave him like two, every single piece of clothing I had at the time. But that gave me a little bit of access, and he would let me come to the studio. So I come to the studio, and that's the first time I was going to like a major studio at the time. And I was just, I was 18, 19 years old. I was 18, and I was just like going to the studio every day. And I was like, this is crazy. You know what I mean? Like this Beanie Siegel. You know what I mean? It was, like, <laughs> it was a whole experience, you know. And um. At the time, Jay-Z had just came out with the Black Album, and uh, Kanye was getting hot. And so he wasn't really doing much in the studio. You know what I mean? I was young, but I wasn't dumb. So I was like, this is my shot. So this, this is my pitch. I was like, yo, you know, you should start a label. You know what I mean? Because Kanye's blowing by you. Jay-Z retired. What you going to do? You got this studio. You're not even doing nothing in it. You should let me do it. You know, da, 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 da. I should be the a and You got that. I'm just cap, 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 cap. You know what I mean? And so he finally makes me a deal. He's like, if you... Find me an artist, I'll make you the a &R. But then, you can't, you won't make any money until we get distribution. I don't really know what that means at the time. It's like fancy a &R talk, you know what I'm saying? But I'm like, cool, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I go and I call, you know, you remember I said, work the relationships that you have. So I knew like a couple artists from the mixtape. So I knew Saigon, and he was hot at the time. So I was like, yo, you want to be Just Blaze? And he's like, yeah, dude. Like, come to the studio right now. So just come, he comes to the studio, they hit it off, they end up making records. So we end up just being in the studio for like nine months. And I used to just, I was cutting down on the mixtapes because I just wanted to get the studio thing. Everything was an experience. I remember one time I walked in a session and I saw like Usher sitting there talking to Chess Blaze. And I'm like 19, I'm like, whoa, this is Usher. This is like Confessions to Usher. This is <laughs> real Usher, you know what I mean? So, and they were there talking about um, this song, Throwback, right? Nazi yeah, because Jay-Z was supposed to be on it originally, and Jay-Z missed the deadline, so he called Jadakiss to get on it last second, because Jadakiss was like, you can't get Jay-Z, get Jadakiss Jay at the time, as far as like, hard New York rappers. And uh, when he left the studio, I'm like, yo, man, so like, how much do you charge Usher for the track? Like, you probably could kill him, you know what I mean? He's like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> you, you don't charge Usher for a track. We, we trade. Like, that's the feature thing. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, oh, and that's the first time I was just, like, getting a one-on-one. I didn't, I didn't know about features and trades and everything. And it was just every time I would go to the studio, it would be, like, a different experience. Like, Saigon would be there. Jay Electronica would just be sleeping on the couch all the time just before he had anything out. And it was just, like, a cool little experience. And we were supposed to call the label Fort Knox. So finally, um... So finally, like, uh, you get a deal with Atlantic Records, right? And, um, and this one, I knew something was back on bad because they had, like, this big dinner, and I wasn't, like, invited to the dinner. I just heard about the dinner through the grapevine. It was, like, it was no Instagram back then, so I couldn't see it, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, all y'all here. No, nah, you know what I mean? So I just heard about it. So then I started asking around. So, like, yeah, so how much was the deal? They're, like, the deal's, like, uh, 650 or 750, right? 750,000. And I asked Justin, how much you got out of it? He's like, well, he got, I got 240, but they're just for my beats. You know what I mean? So six beats, four beats for 60,000 each. Or four beats, six beats for 40,000 each. And I was, so I'm just doing the math. Like, how much he got for the advance? He got like 200,000. So I was like, this is about four or 400,000 going through people's hands right now. So I'm like, what about me? And everybody's like, well, you didn't really get distribution. And Saigon was like, well, you know, he just hit you off. 
So I'm like, I'm from Brooklyn, so it was like two different ways to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? The first one, I was just like, man, I'm, I'm <laughs> But then the second one, I was like, you know what? All right, check this out. I, was, I just had like a, um, I had like a real, I just locked in the whole winter, because I was like around November, December. And I just like, I had like a business part in the time, I was just sitting on her couch. I just wrote this whole business plan. And then this guy called me, um, True Life, he was working with him at the time. He's like, yo, like, can you help me get a deal like you did Saigon? And I was like, cool. You know what I mean? Because one thing, if you can't get nothing, if you can't get nothing, make sure you get credit. Because credit can take you a long way. Somebody will jerk you on the money, but if you get credit, somebody else will come see it. So what happened, one thing about the deal and the whole thing, the press, I was getting press and stuff for it. So I got credit for doing that, and that was the best thing ever. That everybody was like, yo, can you get him a deal? So I ended up getting to work with this guy, True Life. In a four months, he got a deal at uh, Def Jam. And then, you know, they saw me they saw BS, but at that point it didn't matter because every artist in the whole city was calling me. You know what I mean? I was 20 years old, including Saigon and Just Blaze. They were like, hey, can you come back to work? I was like, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but one, one good thing about the situation, the person, the A&R guy who actually signed Saigon saw my worth and he started taking me on his wing and started like mentoring me. And then um, he is the one that actually introduced me to Craig Kalman, who's the first person at Atlantic Records. And um, they gave me a, they offered me an A&R job. So that's like negotiation time, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, all right. So they, um, we go on a Saturday and he can't even get in his office. So we're just sitting there like chairs like this, right? And he's like, um, so what do you want? You know, I told him the whole story. Everything I just told him, I just told him, you know? So he said, what do you want? I was like, I want a, um, I want a cool title. And he's like, director A&R. I'm like, great. That's like, I want an office. He's like, yes. I'm like, okay, cool, I'll send in. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was a terrible negotiator. I didn't know. He's, I'm, even I, I didn't know. I'm, 20, I'm 21 years old. I'm just like, you know, I'm selling mixed I don't know what's going on. I mean, somebody's offering me a job. I get a corporate card. I don't get an office. My mom's mom doesn't know what I'm doing, so she gets that, though. So that, that's end up how I ended up becoming, like, that was my first real a and job. It just came from just messing. So, with with that kind of beginning, you know, so when you look out and, you know, the, you know, some students, some performers, et cetera, who are looking at you, so how do you explain when, when people say, so what are some things I should look out for? What should I be doing now and all that? Because, yeah. Um, I, I mean, just because I got there fast, I didn't have a foundation. So like when I got the job, I stayed there for two years, but I didn't, I didn't have any success. Then I left and started an artist development company. That was going good for a, real, a while. My boy D, he was working with me. You know what I'm saying? And um, but after a while, like I didn't have like a lot of experience being an entrepreneur. I had experience being like mixing hustler, but I didn't know I needed like infrastructure. You know what I mean? I didn't know I needed back office. I might have needed investors. You know, QuickBooks. You know, bookkeeping. Some of the basic things it makes the difference between a hustler and an entrepreneur. So that type of stuff ended up crippling the core of the business. And then like, uh, I ended up going to LA for a business opportunity that didn't work out. So I moved back to LA, to New York, at like 25 years old, with, you know, 24, I think 24 years old, with no real opportunities, mixtapes weren't hot anymore. And I was like, wait a minute, did I just like, did I just lose all my opportunities? So, I would suggest anybody just the, the where I went wrong at that point was I just kept going with the flow versus forcing the flow. Like, you know what I mean? I was just going with whatever opportunity was put in front of me at the time, and I wasn't like directing the traffic. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. You know, if I had the opportunity to be at Harvard or Boston University or MIT or anywhere in this wonderful place, I think it would have been a lot different because if I would have had that same opportunity, Maybe I would have had a network, you know what I mean? Maybe I had somebody to call on to invest. Maybe I had somebody with resources I could go to every day. Maybe I would have had an um, internship opportunity, somebody for something, you know what I mean? I would have had more things in it, and I wish somebody would tell me about a goal. Like, what's, what are you doing this for? Like, what's the point? Because when you're coming up, like, it's only like, okay, I want to be puffy. You just want to <laughs> just pick somebody you want to be, and that's what you want to be. I want to be thinking Dash. I want to be Earth Gotti, you know what I mean? You, you, you don't really think about what that means for you, you know what I mean? So I would have loved this opportunity way more the other way. The other way was kind of by, was by circumstance, but 
you know, I, I don't want my kid to go through that. I don't want my kid to be right here. You know? Seems like you had um, a lot of success, like you said, you just kind of went with the flow. But in doing that, was there any moment that stood out as like, you know, you mentioned how just blaze things panned out that still gave you a win. Were there any moments where you felt like it was too much or you need to change course and how did you handle that? It was like a series of events. So um, it was with the famous firm company, right? And we, we scored a big client. It was like Nicki Minaj, right? And she was this hot rapper out of Queens. She didn't have a butt yet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but she was on these DVDs, you know? She's like, yeah, anybody ever seen a Nicki Minaj one when she's like rapping in the tub, like Biggie? Come up. Yeah, exactly. It's a come up era of uh, Nicki Minaj. So like everyone was trying to like manage her. And uh, she ended up picking me as a manager because I was around her age. I was both Trinidadian, both born in Trinidad, you know what I mean? She, it was a big thing that I was a Capricorn and she was a Sag, but her mom was a Cap, my mom was a Sag. So like, I don't know, it was a big thing for her. She loved that. Whatever works, right? Whatever works, I got the client, you know what I'm saying? But at the time, like, this is not having a proper business structure. Like, I am have a consulting business and a management business, you know what I'm saying? But as I'm giving equal amount of time to both sides of the business, and this is a bad idea. You know, because you have something like a Nicki Minaj who has high potential, you have to start cutting down on other business so you can really focus on her. But I'm focused on random clients who's paying me $2,500 for a package and versus having a superstar who's getting mad. So one time I'm down in D.C. working with a client, and I get a, a get like a, um, get a flat tire, like with 22 inch rims on a Sunday, like on a random street, like on the I-95, you know what I mean? And at the same time, I'm supposed to be back in New York for her Vibe magazine shoot. And at this point, this is her biggest shoot in her career. You know what I'm saying? She has a trailer, it's gonna be a whole page spread, it's a, it's a thing, you know what I mean? And I'm not there, so she just calls me like, wild and cursing out, like, where the F are you? Like, what kind of manager are you? Da 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 da, all my hair, where's my trailer, where's this, bro, bro, wardrobe? And I'm just being young and dumb, just frustrated. I'm like, you know what? I don't need this shit, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm not, I'm quit, like, I quit, I wanna do this. So she calls me back and she's like, really calm. She's like, are you sure? You know what I mean? Like, you know what you're saying? Like, you know what you're doing? I'm like, yeah, I care about this. You know what I mean? Da da da. Got business. I got clients. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't need this. And um, so we separated. You know what I'm saying? We did a lot for the business that we had together through like accounts, or whatever. It was like amicable, but it was still like rough. You know what I mean? And then, you know, the the business I had ended up like sort of sinking slow. And then, she had like super bass, <laughs> so it was, uh, it, it, it was very humbling, you know what I'm saying? It was like very much like, okay, cool, this is life, like really just telling you to just chill out and humble yourself. And um, you know, you could, you could take, at that point, you could take it one of two ways. You could just curl up in a ball, go to bars for the rest of your life, talking about, I used to manage Nicki Minaj. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you, or you could do something about it. And it's also interesting feature on my jeans track. Oh yeah, because that was the full circle moment. So like, you know, from there, like, I went and wrote out a plan. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing we were talking about last night, you know, because everything that came up with last night, anybody who was there, as far as like the goal, the intent, I just, I could tell it really clearly because I did it. You know what I'm saying? At that point, after Nikki was blowing up, I didn't really have any money, you know, my ex-girlfriend was just like, you know, when a guy doesn't have money, you have a good girlfriend, it's not a fun experience. You know what I'm saying? You can't really, can't really take her out, you know, she kind of takes control of the whole It's not fun. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun. And um, so one day we had a real bad incident. Like, you know, not bad, it wasn't an incident, it sounds crazy. We were at a bookstore, and like, I wanted to buy some books. And she was like, you got so many books at the house, won't, you know? Like, just just read the books at the house. But you know, I was just like, man, like, I'm, I'm a loser, man. Like, I gotta, I gotta change my life. So we were living like Lynnhurst, New Jersey. I took the New Jersey Transit up to Chinatown. And I had like, I must have had like $85 to my name. And uh, I got like an addiction to notebooks. So like I bought a notebook, a brand new notebook. To me, if I have a new notebook, it's like possibilities, you know what I mean? So I bought a notebook and I had a pen and I just wrote out my whole life. And I was just like, this is how I told, I told myself, I'm gonna write out my Wikipedia right now. And I just stood in the park, I don't know how long, it must have been hours. I just wrote out like, this is what I'm gonna do. This is where I'm gonna live. This is how I'm gonna do it. And then like, this is like my, I always heard people talk about five year plans. 
I'm like, this is gonna be my five year plan. I wrote it out, I wrote it out. All the people in my life that I cared about, cared about me, and I wrote them on the side, and I wrote out, I'm gonna live here, and I'm gonna be by coastal, I'm gonna start this coming, I'm gonna be an and I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And I rolled up the paper, I put it in my pocket, and my life was changed ever since that moment. That was the most, literally more important than YG outcome. Now, that was the moment my whole life changed. And at that point then, I had a, a roadmap, you know what I mean? Cause now it's like, and I had a timeline. Cause now I'm just like, before I was like, when you're young, you want to do everything young. I do everything before I'm 21. I do everything before I'm 25. I do everything before I'm 30. But at this point I was like 25, 26, I didn't care. I was just like, you know, I just want, I just need to get through this. You know what I mean? But I had a big goal. My, my goal was like, I just want to be like, a ruin of the best a &R guy. I want to be the best at &R. They just give me there. You know what I mean? That was my big goal. So I started year one. I broke up with the girl. You know what I mean? I just I started writing out lists. It was the internet at the time. So all these internet rappers are hot. Big Sean, J. Cole, Drake, you know what I mean? So I just write down a piece of paper and I would just do my research. Like I was like, I, th I told myself I was like Mel Kiper Jr. I was a researcher. Like I would rank them in order, you know what I mean? Then I got a budget to do shows, to do shows. So I'll just do book shows, you know what I mean? I'll put, bring in Nipsey Hussle and Big Crit and Currency and Dom Kennedy and I was only, you know, I, was, I was paying them not much because before they had booking agents like 750, 1500, you know what I mean? Joel Ortiz and I was bringing them all to, to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And I was like, there's this show called The Famous Factory and it was like, boom, I'm back on. Then I got a, a kid, um, had a client, Rich Hill, and one brothers wanted to sign him because The weekend liked him. And they signed him only because The weekend mentioned him in the meeting. So I was like, cool, you know what I mean? So he got a deal for 150000 we got a $50,000 advance, and we split it 30-20. So I got 20 k and then, and then his pops was like, you should move to L.A. Boom, you know what I'm saying? So now I'm in L.A., moving around, I got a record deal, I got like an expense account, you know what I mean, da 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 I get a, um, I meet Travis Scott, right, because this label that he signed to, Warner Brothers, uh, they said I could just come up there every day and just hang out, you know what I mean? So they're like, you probably going to find something, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I would just go up to the office every day, and nobody could tell I didn't work there. Everybody thought I was like a full-time employee at A&R. Because I walked in there one day and I told the guy, I said, look, man, like, I don't need any money. I just just give me something real. You know what I mean? So he signed the artist, I had a little bit of money, so I would just show up every day. I didn't even have a car. I don't even Uber back then. I think I just take taxis and whatever. I don't know how I used to get there every day. I would show up, I'd be clean. People got their haircuts, so I'd get my haircut. I can't afford the haircut. The haircut's like $80, and I was just like, I'll pay for them. So I got it, you know what I mean? I didn't have it. <laughs> yeah. And um, but then um, one time, but just being a lot of it, a lot of this shit is just access, and that's what here is is access. You know what I mean? When you're on, this is is, is access. So an intern came up to me, not knowing I was an intern too, <laughs> and he said, "You gotta hear the demo. This kid, this kid, uh, Travis Scott." So he gives me the demo. I love the demo. So I'm like, "All right, cool. Like, let's get him. In. Let's get him up here, right?" So we have a meeting with him, and uh, Travis comes up, and he's like bouncing off the wall. He's just like how he is now. He plays like two instrumentals, a um, couple mumbles on the track. He doesn't have much out. He has like this song, not even XX, I forgot what the song is. Yeah, he just came out with this group called Travis, Travis and Jason. You know what I mean? He had a song called Animal, that's what he had. He had Animal featuring T.I. That was like a big thing. And um, so I walk in the room, I tell my friend, like, yo, I'm a friend, the guy we was working with at the time, like, yo, we got this guy who's gonna, who's crazy. You know what I mean? He's like, what, what do you wanna do? Like, uh, you know, I'm about to leave. So I go tell the other guy, he's like, oh, okay, cool, that's cool, you know? So I'm like, no, this is it. So he goes to he goes to Atlanta. I don't know if he signs to TI. Comes back, he's getting real hot. I'm trying to sign him. I'm like, I'm with him every day. He gets kicked out of his house. I get the president of Warner Brothers to like put a corporate car down and put him in the SLS hotel for like five days. You know what I mean? I'm like, and all these A&R guys are hanging out with him. I'm like, yo, you wanna go to Coachella? <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, yeah. I was like, I don't, I don't can't get his Coachella, but I knew like a party I could possibly get into in Coachella. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it was like nylon or something, but it was better than nothing, not a car. <laughs> so I was like, boom. So we go, I take Travis, we go to the show, we sneak in to the nylon party. And we had a good old time, step back, and after a while he ended up signing to uh, Epic Records. But he never forgot, because while I was like working with him and trying to sign him, I had a friend who was A&R, Meek Mill, and I was like, can I bring this guy I'm trying to sign him to the studio? He said, sure. So I bring Travis by the studio, and we're like drunk, and we just walking in like, oh, we're just a mess, you know what I'm saying? He ends up doing the song with Meek Mill and he ends up on Meek Mill's mixtape. And he never forgot that that was his first like industry feature of somebody he wasn't signed to on somebody else's song. So like he always kept that relationship. So me trying to sign him, it would come back to play a few years later. But at that point I'm just like, man, I'm just like going for it. I'm just like, 
this is like year three. And I'm like, man, I'm making progress, you know what I mean? And finally, like, I get, um, I started to get offers. And I get, like, Def Jam is really interested in me. And Warner Brothers wants to hire me full time. And this woman, Sylvia Rome, is thinking about hiring me at Epic. So, and a key thing in this is mentors. Like, if you have a mentor, you know what I mean? The trick about mentors is just never wait for them to make you. Like, you're my mentee. You just, you just adopt a mentor. And you just harass them until they give in. <laughs> that's the trick of mentorship. You know what I'm saying? You see somebody you like, you just gotta like, that's my mentor now. You harass them, but don't don't be like, yo, I wanna have a meeting to mentor me, you gotta just be like, give something. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, did you see these sneakers? Hey, did you see this artist? Hey, you heard about the show? Hey, I see your artist gonna be there, da, da, da. Just give something of value. You know, like with my mentor, I'd always just show up on him every day. You know what I mean? If you just wanna do anything, you, you need to take some notes. You know, walk around, like whatever you want to do, like I would just like just whatever he want, you know what I'm saying? It's like I go there now, Jesus using me for it's like Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad, like you know what I mean? And my mentor was like, so anytime I see somebody who I, I took as a mentor, I would just treat it like that, and I wouldn't expect anything in return besides just a little bit of like knowledge and if they answer my questions every once in a while. So one time around that summer, um, I saw Chris Lighty, that was dead in um, Santos Party House in New York. And I was like, this is my chance. He's like, my space. You know what I mean? He's like, like, I know this whole world. He don't know this world. So I run up to him, like, and I talk to him, talk to another AR guy, and I'm like, yo, you gotta have, when you gotta see these moments, you gotta have your pitch ready. You know what I mean? So I go up to him, I'm like, yo, you see this world right here? This is me right here. I know everything in this world, but I don't know what you know. You know what I mean? I can show you this stuff. So he's like, okay, cool. So come to my office next week. So I come to his office next week. We start building a relationship, building a relationship, building a relationship. I tell him, you should sign him, you should sign this hustle, you should sign this person, you know, sign Troy, you know what I'm saying, you should sign, sign that. And, um, you know, he's just like, yo, you're real smart, man, you know what I mean? And I'm like, all these people are really, really, like, trying to sign me, and Sylvie Rohn, and Def Jam, he said, listen, man, it's all cool and all, but you gotta get some equity, you know what I mean? You gotta own something. So that all the money I made is from equity, and I never forgot that, you know, as far as, like, the ownership. So you have an opportunity to own something, just own it, you know what I mean? He ended up passing away right after that, maybe a couple weeks later. It's kind of messed me up for a while, but I never really, the, the, the small advice and the small window I got with him meant a lot, you know what I mean? So finally when I got with Def Jam, you know what I mean? They made me an offer, and I was playing hardball at first, right? They had called me and it was like, um, made me an offer for 75,000. And I was like, I ain't taking that, I want 100, you know what I mean? So like, I ain't had no money. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I was just like on my friend's couch and, um. They didn't really call me back for a few weeks. And you know, those few weeks were like a dark few weeks, because then you just start thinking like, man, like, did I just mess up? <laughs> you know what I mean? Did I just work this hard for this opportunity? And uh, I think like maybe after three weeks or a month, they called me back and they said, hey, man, we can get you 85. I'm like, deal. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> and I told myself, because that was in line with my goal, you know, I told myself, man, like, they ain't never seen nobody work as hard as I'm about to work. I don't care who they get me. Like, I'm about to go crazy. I felt like a a pit bull that's ready to go, you know what I'm saying? And when I got him, uh, the first three artists they gave me was um, uh, YG, Lil Dirk, and the person I was most excited to work with, uh, Lil Reese from Chicago. I never heard Lil Dirk's music at the time. I used to play YG at parties, but I loved Lil Reese, you know what I mean? And um, that was my task. And then Lil Reese ended up having an incident with this girl in Chicago, so he just got shelved. You know what I mean? So I had a little YG and a little dirt. So I just told myself, I'm gonna just treat these artists like they Rihanna. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they Rihanna and me, because I don't get nothing from Rihanna, you know what I'm saying? So like, that was my, that was my mind state. And I was just like, hella high water, this is, this is the, the universe helping me go in my direction. So I gotta, I gotta make this work, you know? Well, we're at, um, at the point now where we uh, would normally open this up, but is there anything in particular you want to talk about first or you want to just work it through? Any yes, questions? questions. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're going to, um, we want you to talk into the mic if you have questions or, or comments and, and also <clears throat> try to keep them, um, you know, within a reasonable time limit. Uh, and uh, so we want to hold back some of the stories one might tell so we can get to the question or comment if possible. Um, and I, I think the only other thing is please introduce yourself uh, when you ask uh, questions or comments. And 
we have, yeah. And uh, could you do this on your desk? Okay, so if anyone has questions or Oh, All right. no, no, you take it to the oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Jacob Pompe. Um, I have a question. Uh, so I'm wondering, like, with an artist that has been right had a meeting with a label, say, um, unsigned, or the other labels. I mean, I like I've witnessed like uh, bidding wars and such, but I've also heard things that that a and may not be interested if a meeting has already occurred with another label. So is it different every single artist, or no? Nah, I mean. People are always interested when they hear you working with other labels too. You just gotta be smooth about it. It's like almost like dating. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like you almost gotta be like kinda like coy. And then, you know, I'm like, you know, we had to meet with another label. Who I can't really talk about. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be smooth. The bidding war only thing a bidding war is is two people wanna sign you. It's not based on anything else you're doing. It's just literally two people wanna sign you, then somebody else might jump into thing. That's the only thing that makes a bidding war. It's nothing there's no different than eBay. You might like one MTV socks, you know what I mean? There's somebody in Portland likes MTV socks, and you got who's who's gonna pay more for the MTV socks? This is just the way it goes. So I don't, there's no right or wrong way with that. You know what I'm saying? It's like uh, the more interest, the better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It will. It won't. It won't hurt you though. Okay. Uh, what's going on, Super Mom? My name is Newman. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Uh, as a producer, what's what's the best way? to uh, get beats uh, some of the artists that you may manage or that you, how, how, how's the best way to go about it? Because I know the email game now is, you, I don't know, it's not personalized. Like you send, you send an MP3 attached file, it's not it's not that personal connection as you, you would get being in the studio. So what do you think the best way is to go about that as a producer? The best way I've seen producers break in the last five years you know, if you think of like DJ Mustard, Metro Boomin, Young Chop, Sunny Digital, Lex Luger, um, who's a guy from New York with French Montana? Um, you know what I'm talking about? Harry Fraud. Whatever you can think of, the guys who really made a career and not just a placement, they came up with people who were coming up. You know what I'm saying? They came up with Chief Keys, French, the Chicago movement. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I would see what artists I could get the most attention with and the most real estate with. Like, where you from? Boston. Like, if I were you, I would try to get it with, um, like, Cousin Stiz, you know what I'm saying? I will give somebody who's trying to break locally here and grow with that sound. Because let's say you send a beat in and you get off Drake's album, right? And you just kneel in the haystack, you know, and God's playing, boom, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so then, like, What's gonna, what's gonna happen? Boy, one is gonna, yo, you know, add some drums on there, you know what I mean? Forty's gonna add a little bit of it, your knee is gonna kinda get edged out, you're gonna go for a publishing deal, they're like, well, you only have 15% of the record, so we could offer you, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, or you could have more real estate on somebody you could make music with, that you actually produce, you know what I'm saying? And that is way better, because then it's something from Cousin Stiz Pops, then you grow together. If the next big thing out of Boston, or this just general area goes off, I, I would invest most of my time into that because then if your sound is really a sound, you'll create a sound in the whole area. You know, I had a friend who's doing like a whole documentary on Teddy Riley because, you know, he was one of the big producers in Harlem and then moved to Virginia and started having like Pharrell work with him, and Missy and Timbaland. So I would, I would just get whoever you could get FaceTime with locally. Or if you get somebody bigger who like, so really believes in you, do it. If somebody bites, you throw it out and they bite. They say, can I come play you some more records, like in person? Because that's when you're really gonna be good. The other route you can take is almost like the producer internship. Like you start sending beats to producers. Producers always listen to your beats. The rappers might not listen, but the producers don't listen. I would send beats to all the producers and be like, yo, I got loops, I got this, I got that. And you gotta just do what Kanye did with D-Dot or all the producers do, they come up under another producer. And at first it's like, oh, this guy is jerking me or whatever, but you learn, you know what I'm saying? And after like a year or two of that, you get out of that, and you're the man, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, uh, those are the two routes I'd take, either attach with a local artist or, or crew or label, or go underneath another producer and come up underneath them. Appreciate it. Hi, my name is Mike. 
at Mene yesterday, you can see you again. Uh, my question is, what do you think are the telltale signs that a, a label or manager or an A&R person wants to exploit you as an artist rather than actually help you grow and become the best you can be? If they keep telling you to send in music, but like not really like sending a flight or like sending like a plan, you know what I mean? Or they like, yo man, can you introduce me to your producer or like that, DD2 man, you know what I'm saying? If they not, if they ask me to do stuff that's not like getting to your goal, your bottom line, but it's just like, I feel like it's going too much one way, I would stop. I would just stop talking to that person. You know what I'm saying? I, I think that's how you can tell, because you, then you feel like you're being used. There's nothing wrong with being used unless you can use go both ways, but if you're just trying to like go one way, I would stop that. You know what I'm saying? That's that's like kind of like a, a telltale sign of somebody's being a creep. Could you relate that to something personal for you? Like personal experience? The, that Just Blake story. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like showing up every day for nine months. You know what I'm saying? Thinking like I'm going to get this deal. You know what I'm saying? I, and then really like, he could offer me like $1,500. He could offer me $1,000. He could offer me anything. And I would have took it at the time because I just wanted a, a reward for the work I was doing. You know what I mean? But instead I felt like I was... Uh, I was, I was strung along and I ended up being resentful of that situation, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's kind of like the situation I would most compare it to, you know what I'm saying? So I don't really try to do that with people. I don't want to just talk to people for months, you know what I mean? So yeah, he's sending me, I'll try to give him a quick answer, like, okay, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm not feeling. People got to move on with their lives, you know what I mean? You don't want to just fight, you know what I mean? Have somebody have you in that weird space, you know what I'm saying? Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Dari Yush, um, and good to see you again. Uh, my question was, from your perspective as an A&R, um, you know, in music today, especially with Twitter and stuff, it's hard for artists to fly under the radar and things um, that can be controversial for an artist can get spread, you know, in a day or in an afternoon by Complex, Double XL, everybody picks it up. So from your perspective, you know, as an A&R, if you hear it, um, if you hear about something with one of your artists in terms of uh, controversy, how do you go about it? How do you start thinking about it? You know, whether it be from whether you saw it on like your Twitter timeline or whether you saw it or heard it from like your artist. Like the, my artist has is in a controversy. Yeah. Well, it just depends how bad it is. You know what I'm saying? If they like get caught like like shooting somebody on camera, because you know, I understand like my career is like I I don't even mean to say like a joke like. Like, I get bad calls, you know what I mean? Like I got a call one time, like, yo, like, my YG just got shot. You know what I'm saying? That's the type of calls I could get. Or so-and-so is in Travis in jail. Or, like, the calls could get crazy. You know what I mean? But if you get a call, like, yo, Funk Master Flex talking shit about you. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> then you, you just tell them, just, like, chill. You can make it 48 hours without responding, no one's going to care. Because that's the cycle of attention. You know, nobody cares after 48 hours unless it's a really, 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 really funny meme. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> nobody cares. Everything goes away. People, it's too much, there's too much stuff going on. There's too much things. There's too many memes. There's too much Instagram. There's too much stimulation. This whole company is just pumping shit out. So, just got to weather through the storms. Make it 48 hours, nobody's going to care. But if a video pops up, <laughs> got a cold crisis. <laughs> Some of those calls sound like you're a lawyer. Somebody got shot, somebody's in jail, that's, yeah, it's kind of interesting, some of the calls you get. But are there other calls you get that are just separate from that, that are more like, do the artists ever call just to tell you about life events and things on their own? Yeah, like they'll call saying like, you know, I'm having a baby, or they'll call like, yo, can you make it to this room right now? You know, um, like a lot of, like I remember the time like, uh, I was at Made in America, and uh, Travis was like, come on, we're going to meet the president. I'm like, we going to Obama? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we go over there, like, he wants me to take a picture with him. You know what I mean? So we go over there, and like, we go on, like, this, like, Illuminati tent. You know what I'm saying? And just, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, seeing, I'm seeing all kinds of people, you know what I'm saying? I'm seeing Sizzle over there, you know what I'm saying? I'm seeing Kevin Parker from Pink Pop over there, you know what I mean? Beyonce's talking to Kelly Rowland in the corner. And it's, like, and like Punch from TDE and, like, uh, Jay-Z's talking and, like, Bill Clinton's right there. You know what I mean? So is anybody a photographer here? Okay, so, you know sometimes when you get in them type of situations, people want you to take a picture, but you don't want to get like, fuck up the whole vibe and get kicked out. So I'm like, Shh, this is crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, he's over there talking, every time he's talking, to, end up talking to Bill Clinton. 
for a while, and he's, every time he saw the book club, he was just looking at me like, picture. <laughs> 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 and I was like, you know what I mean? I was scared, but I ended up taking a picture, and that ended up becoming my most popular picture. Or you get in a call in a room where, like, um, you just get called in certain rooms where, like, it's delicate rooms. You know what I'm saying? I think, like, one thing as you move your career up as an artist or an executive, people pay attention to how you how much you report on your social media and people would not you would lose an opportunity just because you just too social. You know what I'm saying? So I'm mean, like, yo, you should you fight just fight Jason. Like, nah man, we're always on his phone. Like, you know what I mean? It's the thing, you know what I mean? So like the further you go up, the more delicate the rooms are. And you won't get let in a room if people feel like that something will be left out the room. You know what I mean? People it's a circle of trust that you build over a long period of time and you can just lose it in one incident by just just being thirsty. You know what I'm saying? So like I get in a lot of rooms like that and it's like real real delicate rooms, you know what I'm saying? It's like some rooms you got some NDAs, it's crazy. Hey, what's up, man? Uh, so I'm over here, hidden behind the pole. Uh, I go by by Jimmy Kafka. Uh, thanks for coming, by the way. I just want to know your perspective on like just the like how hip hop is moving right now. Like, do you think it's getting oversaturated or anything like that? Or I just want. To... Um, I like how there's certain things I love about hip hop, like the shows. Like shows when I was coming up would just be like. 40 people on stage, and you'd be like, yo, which one is Nas? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then everybody bobbing their head. It was hoping you don't get robbed or shot. You know what I'm saying? Or you go to like an underground show, you know, like a Tell Up Ali show or something like that. And it's just like a lot of dreads there, you know what I mean? A lot of incense in the air. And it was just like different. Those are the vibes, you know what I'm saying? But now you go to a show and it's mosh pits, it's people playing all kind of music, people are stage diving. It's fun as hell now. Like I wish, <laughs> like I wish I was 15 now. When it comes to the shows, like the shows are better than ever. I think the beats are better than ever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think like you go back and listen to like a beat from the '90s. It was like, what the hell is this? Was, <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys doing? You know, you hear a metro beat now. I mean, you crash your car. You don't even need the lyrics. <laughs> So I, I think I think those two aspects of hip hop is uh, better than ever. Uh, I think the, the the lyricism could be a lot better. You know what I'm saying? I feel like you got all these good beats and you're not really talking about nothing. Uh, the artist development of it, I don't think people spend enough time developing. I, you know, I, I was talking about before, like the greats spend like 30, 40, 50, 60 editions of a record, and but they everything. That's why the records are so media. That's why they last so long. Versus like these new guys, they'll do like one take. You know what I mean? Put the song out and it'll be cool for a little bit, but then you don't want to hear it for a long period of time. It's a certain level of love and energy you have to put on each song for it to last. You know what I mean? So I think the art development, the lyricism, and the overall storytelling. Because people always like, oh, well, that, oh, that you should sell him. But is it though? You know what I'm saying? Like, who's like the top three selling rappers, do you think? So my name won't name. Jay Z. Kendrick. 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 And maybe like Migo, Migo, man. But J. Cole's big too. You know what I'm saying? Like J. Cole, Drake, and Kanye, and Kendrick, Kanye. Sometimes like they're like the really the biggest rappers. And um, I was talking to Dave Free about it, and Dave Free is Kendrick's manager. We we're talking about albums, and he said, you know what? We do a TDE. Like we make music to people to live their lives to. Like if you make a club record. There's a small section of the world that can relate to it, to a club. Like, I didn't start going to clubs until like 18, you know what I mean? So like, it's like from 18 to like 30, maybe, in certain cities, in a certain type of demo, like, that's the people who like club music. But the records that are big, songs about like loyalty and love and pain, those are the records that last a long time because you gotta make music that people drive from 9 a.m. to. You know what I mean? What are you gonna clean your house to a Sunday to? These are records that's way more function. Like certain songs have certain functions in life. Turning up is a very small function in life. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Cleaning your house is way bigger than that. I clean my house way more than I turn up. You know what I'm saying? I do my laundry way more than I turn up. So it's like you need, I'm sad way more than I turn up. I'm in love way more than I turn up. So I think that a lot of this new generation are missing some of the basic principles. What I would do if I was a an artist or a producer, I would study movies and 
each movie has themes. You know what I'm saying? Like there'll be two. Anybody study filming here? Okay, so you know how they have film themes? I would do my songs like that. That's what I would do. I would be like, okay, cool. What's the theme of this record? You know what I mean? Start off like the big ones, like this love, you know what I mean? Heartbreak, you know, and make a song about each one of the hoes and then work your way from there. You know what I mean? That'll help your songwriting a lot. Because a lot of these guys have great voices, you know what I mean? And they're really catchy and they're really cool looking, but they spend so much time trying to, so much time like clout chasing, you know what I'm saying? And it's become about the gimmicks, the related artists, the Supreme, the Instagram, the Snap, you know what I mean? Whole lot of gang shit, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of just quick shit that comes and goes. Hey, what's up, bro? Um, back here. My name is Glenn. Um, my question is, early I heard you said your job usually working with an artist is to keep their confidence high, right? So I'm sure they're relying on you, but when your confidence isn't high, who do you rely on or where do you go? Um, you know, you got to have like, that's why you, it's just like anybody. It's just like you got to have your family, your friends, you know what I'm saying? Got to have a real solid balance. Because like, one thing I do is I don't spend all my time with the artist because then they start taking advantage of you at that point. You know what I'm saying? Then it's just like, you just a flunky or a crew member just doing whatever for them. So I try to spend a significant amount of time with them, but then I also go back and do stuff so I can bring stuff back. You know what I mean? Like, it's more than just being like, are you the best? You know what I mean? Sometimes you have to come back and be like, yo, like, you should watch this movie. I think you'd be inspired. Or like, have you wrote to this song yet? You know what I mean? Or like, you know, you should really, I, I, I just, Came, went to Cambridge and had a good conversation. I think you should do X, Y, and Z now. You know what I mean? You also have to be a constant source of inspiration. Always bring magazines by, to bring books by, bring movies, ideas in the studio, trying to take off the sports, put it on a movie. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just small things. Just always. You have to. You're an artist. You know, there's a lot of artists in here, right? Yeah, yeah. So like, you need to be constantly stimulated. And if you don't have people around who are stimulating you for your art. It gets frustrating because then you like going to eat. You know what I'm saying? So you need to always be. I always need to be constantly stimulating the artists that I work with. Pause. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, I need to like make sure that they have everything that they need and things are just going. You know what I mean? Two part. That was a two part question. My last question is: um, After your interview with B Dot and Elliot, I saw Nikki said she would work with you again. So have you like given that any thought in the future? Like what you would want to do with her on plan? Um, no, but it was nice to, just to have, you know what I'm saying? Like when we did the My Hit Up remix, you know what I'm saying? I think that uh, she she uh, she had reached out to me a couple weeks later and offered me like a um, like a day-to-day -day manager position. Um, but that wasn't something that I was interested in. I, I really like being like A&R. That's all like I'll be an A&R, you know what I mean? But I really like where I'm going, like the artists I'm working with. But it just felt good, it's like full circle, you know what I mean? I think like my overall goals moving forward is like I want to be like a like a Rick Rubin or something. I want to be able to do like a project and just go on somebody call me like Nikki says I want to make a reggae based album. You know what I'm saying? Like a Trinidadian type of vibe. But I'm like, okay, cool. Lock me in for like six months. You know what I'm saying? I would do something like that, like project to project. Um, as long as it's like kind of like in line with my goals and what's really what I'm really trying to do. But she's a lot of fun. She's really smart. Um, and you rarely, you rarely get opportunities like that in life where you, you just kind of like, you make huge mistakes and you get a chance to kind of fix it, you know what I'm saying? So that was a real, real, real good feeling. Uh, hey, how you doing? Uh, my name is Tef Poe. I'm actually the Najee Jones fellow here. Uh, shout out Dr. Martin. One of <laughs> but uh, I have a question about numbers versus impact. Uh, and the reason I ask that question is because I'm an independent artist uh, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I put out a record that I feel like was critically acclaimed in the underground last year. Cornell West did a bunch of interludes for me. I worked with everybody from Most Def to Killer Mike. I can name drop a thousand days, thousand times. Just name drop forever. Uh, I recently signed a six-figure book deal. I say all that to say, often as an independent artist, the resume that you're building doesn't always quite translate to the labels. Like they have no clue that I have a certain impact on the ground level. But uh, in terms of commercial value, 
can you take all these things into an A&R's office and sit them on the desk like you're talking to certain people right now? And the thing that my manager is trying to translate to them is like, yo, we already got equity in this game right here. Like, we're not really necessarily hurting for the check. We're independent, been doing our thing. We would love for the extra muscle to come in and add some creatine to it. But regardless of us getting a deal or not, we're going to still be functional. So I'm asking about, like, how do you translate impact when in a game like today where, where like, somebody like uh, Extension, next Extension, he might have a million SoundCloud on one record. And they're like, yo, we got to sign that right now. Versus my story is a little bit different. It's, a, it's actual getting it out the mud and trying to make pull something out of that that way. You know what I mean? Like if I was your manager, I would kind of like, at first I would look at the person I was trying to sign to. Like I wouldn't do a project that's narrated by Cornell West and then try to sign to the same label as XXX. You know what I'm saying? It would just, I would try to see like, well, who did like Rhapsody? You know what I mean? Right. Who's working with like J. Cole? You know what I'm saying? Who's working with the people that fit my skill set. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like being a um like being an athlete, you know what I mean? If I'm coming out of college, I wanna go with somebody and I'm a point guard, I wanna go with people who produces point guards. You know what I'm saying? I don't wanna go with somebody who just do one and doneers because that's not what I'm here for. I need certain kind of development, certain kind of looks. You know what I'm saying? Then I think especially now it's coming like the wild wild west because big money is back in music. You know what I'm saying? As far as like not just like the deals, but just investing. Like Wall Street's looking at at, at music and it's like, okay, cool. I'll give you fifteen million dollars to start a label. I'll give you the Gates they used to have like sixty, seventy million dollars to start a label and get LA Reid the same kind of money. There's more players out there than just Universal, Warner Brothers, and things with real bread. And there's people like Empire, people with STEM. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of different players out here that will go and front you music based on what you've been doing, you know what I mean? People like Mass Appeal, you know what I mean, Nas's label, you know what I'm saying, like Peter and the Burger and those guys, they just got another level of investment to invest in a joint. The other type of places I would start, you know, people who are looking for what the stuff that I do. Like, oh, you sign Davies, you sign this, like, okay, cool, you're gonna get me. You know what I mean? Like, oh, okay, this manager is the one who got Rhapsody, all those Grammy nominations, okay, cool, I'm going there. You know what I mean? I, I would just kinda like, look who's really invested into and understands where I'm going with it and get those people to buy in versus trying to get, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> trying to like bark at a cat, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so. All right. Um, I'm Dart Adams. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, producers I know, left the center, a and R. Um, so my question is, I know that you were young coming in the game and you didn't exactly know what an a and R was, but I know that you studied the game and you figured out things after the fact since you're a hustler. So once you figured out what an A and R artist and repertoire actually did, who are the people that you went back and found and said, "Those are the people I want to model what I do after"? Um, you know, the first one that comes to mind is like hip hop. You know, what I mean, Keanu Hip Hop Joshua. He A and R, Jay Z's albums from Volume One to the Black Album, and then he found Kanye. You know, and he ended up A and R the first executive producer in the first five projects. And I just like when I would walk the street, man, the way people would treat him. Like they would have them with a certain irreverence, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, like, oh, you're ill, you know what I mean? And I really like that about him. I like the fact that he did that. Uh, Rick Rubin's kind of like an A&R to me, you know what I mean? He's not really making beats. He's over there, he's meditating, he's going through song structure with you, you know what I mean? He's really just kind of a and on your album. So I think that he is real cool. Um, no ID. I know he's a producer too, but I think he's an incredible uh, mind. Like, I called him out on it the other day, like, I told him that like, 444 was just like Nas's life is good, just the same concept done with a different artist. He's like, how do you know that, man? <laughs> and I was like, I paid attention, he said, yeah, but he said Nas didn't fully commit to the concept. You know what I'm saying? Nas had the wedding dress on his, on his thing, he had an album we're talking about breaking up Khalees, it's basically, basically like old people rap. You know what I'm saying? Old oh, rapper rap. But he like, he did the same concert with Jay-Z and Jay-Z bought in. So I, I really like a lot of producers. You know what I mean? I like Dr. Dre, like Mike Will. You know what I mean? People who could go in there, and they're really A&R records. They just don't get called an A&R. Dave Free, um, these guys, uh, this guy Cash from XO, 
you know, these guys are real special record makers. They're not necessarily in the building a &Rs because a lot of those in the building a &Rs get have different skill sets, more than like talent scouts or professional friends. You know what I mean? I like the people who really produce and help make the music. You know what I mean? Those are people I really try to tip my cap to. Uh, my name is Nikia, sorry I'm a little sick. Thanks for coming out. Um, my question is, so as an A&R, you're kind of like the bridge between the label and the artist. So how do you manage expectations like on the label side while also staying true to the you know, creativity of the artist? Yeah, it's like the push and pull, you know what I mean? Because the artists want, they want the best possible product and they want 100% creative control and they don't want to be rushed, they want to take as much time as possible. And the label wants the project out now, they want it out this quarter, they want it under budget, you know what I mean? So what you gotta do is you gotta appease kind of like both sides. Because if you give the artist too much control, and too much like, not control, but if you give them too much time, they'll never drop because it'll become paralysis by analysis. You, they need a little bit of pressure. People need deadlines. If you don't have a deadline, you'll never finish. You'll work on it, you'll be detoxed. Like, no one pressure. <laughs> No, Dr. Dre don't have no e &R, so like he has no label pressure, so the album never came out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sometimes you need a little bit of pressure. And with the label, it's your job as an a &R to let them know why you're still investing the money and why you're still uh, going at it. You know, when you're like a young a &R, you don't really have that clout, so you gotta just fight with your whole life. You know what I mean? I remember when I was at Def Jam and we were holding off mixing YG's album because we wanted mixed by Ali to mix his album. And he's a TDE mix engineer, but he was um, finishing school by Q's project. So the CEO of the label got real mad and had this big meeting, right? And had everybody, the, all the legal people, the marketing team, everybody come and it's just me like on a video conference, right? And he started screaming at me like, what the F is this? Like, no one ever like, sold more records because of a mix engineer. We need to make this date of February 25th. Da 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 da. It just started going crazy, you know? And, um, you know, most people at that point would have kind of folded because, you know, if you did a job. But at that point, that comes to that bond you have with your artists. Like, are you, you know, are you going to fight for them or are you going to fold? So my thing was, like, I told them, look, man, like, I, mean, I ain't going home for Christmas this year. You know what I mean? I miss my whole summer working on this album, and I'm not going to rush it at the end and just ruin this body of work. So if you guys want to go tell that artist directly that you want to push this date up, you go do that, but I'm not telling them that. And you get her like a pin drop in the room. Like my boss was there, everybody was there. And um, you know, at the end of the day, they kind of like mean girl me for the next month or so. <laughs> and, they, they ain't talk to me in the hallways and stuff like that. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, though, our project came out and it was successful and it went number one and nobody remembers that. You know what I'm saying? So you always have to keep the goal in mind and sometimes people are going to be mad. And, but you always have to protect the art, but you also have to make sure the art comes out. Because music shit is about timing, too. Because if you catch a rhythm and you catch a song and everybody's loving it in the studio and he's like, man, we should put this out right now. You're like, hold up, hold up, hold up. We don't wait till it's the right time. And then that song never comes out. Like, how many times did that happen? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you gotta tell somebody like you're just lick the shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Put it on SoundCloud, get this out. So you need both sides to make the work. And if you're like an independent label, you need to have somebody there A and R. Even if it's not a major label, somebody needs to be like stunned. So hi, uh, my name is Kyle. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, so I'm from Miami, and you know I've kind of grown up in a bilingual work environment my entire life. And I'm noticing that in the past year, year and a half, like bilingualism between English and Spanish has started to become more prominent in hip hop. Um, you know, artists like Bad Bunny, you know, the song Crippy Kush with Travis Scott and Tony One Savage featuring on that. And I was wondering, with the future of hip hop, do you think this is kind of just a fad that'll last a year or two and kind of go away, or do you think that bilingualism will really start to take hold of uh, hip hop in America? I, I think it's gonna get crazier. I think you know, I have uh, this new artist I work with, Shaq West. He has a uh, uh, one song. He's rapping half in English. It has in uh, Senegalese, you know what I'm saying? I think like it's going to be different languages that people would be bilingual. I think it's going to be like uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday about K-pop. You know what I mean? It's going to be like English K-pop songs. You know what I'm saying? I think it's going to be Spanish and French. You know what I mean? It's going to be American uh, English and different dialects. 
you know, they, they, they're thinking there's going to be like close to a billion new people on different Spotify's and Apple Music and just different music networks and just from Africa alone in the next two years. You know what I'm saying? I think Japan is like the, the strongest growing market. You know, the world's getting smaller because of globalization. You know, I think it's going to be reflective in the music. I think you're going to start seeing combinations of things that you've never seen before. You know what I mean? Because now the, 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 the playing field is like a lot more even. So I think um, English and Spanish should just start. You know what I mean? I think it's going to get way crazier, way deeper, and, and way more intricate. Hey, uh, my question is dealing with social media and like with the rise of importance of like all these social media platforms, and I feel like you've been in the industry from the very beginning with like MySpace and everything up till now. And I was just wondering, like, what's changed in your role as an A and R, like discovering, nurturing new artists, and like what's become more important, what's become less important, what sort of stayed the same? What stayed the same is the song making process. You know what I mean? Making sure like the song is still great, because you know, you know, uh, 15 years ago. We were trying to put the song on a mix show radio and get it to a mixtape DJ to leak it on his, on his show on Friday. Now we might try to get a song to an influencer, we might make a skit out of it. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, the music's still the music. The mediums are always going to change. There's always going to be new social media. It's always going to be like, before having a song and a bunch of top eights were a big deal. You know what I'm saying? Right now, having your Snapchat's not really going to be worth much anymore because of Kylie Jenner. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, you can't chase the medium because then you die with the medium. You know what I mean? There's always going to be a black planet. There's always going to be a MySpace. There's always going to be a Twitter. There's always going to be an Instagram. There's always going to be whatever the hell's going on. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you can't chase that. You just got to chase that music and like let the people like figure that shit out, figure that shit out. <laughs> you know? What's up, man? My name's Tommy. Um, if you're working with a producer and a supremely talented artist, like you work with YG and Mustard on one album, do they sit down and go through 300 beats and decide what he likes, or are they crafting projects, each track kind of in a direction based on what the artist wants to do with it? Everybody's different. You know, if you're blessed to have a producer that can hold most of the project, it makes my job a lot easier, because then you're just managing the egos between the artist and the producer. Because there will be egos, you know what I'm saying? Like, who's more important, the beat or the lyrics? You know what I'm saying? The answer is always the beat, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just tell you that right now. The yeah, producer, producer runs the show, but you can't tell the artist that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because everybody has an ego. But it's called music for a reason, and it's not called poetry. You know? Um, that's why. I, I, that's why I think like with 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 the, with the process, and sometimes you don't have that. You know what I mean? Like with Travis, we have Mike Dean, but Mike Dean mixes and touches everything at the end. So in the meantime, we have to navigate. Tens of producers, and almost we probably went through a hundred different producers for Astro World already. As far as like pulling up sessions, going through beat packs, you know what I'm saying? Just to get a beat here, a beat there. But you need somebody to kind of crystallize it. So everybody is different. You know, I mean, some people are self-produced. They don't need anybody. J. Cole produces his own records. You know what I'm saying? And some people, you look at the credits, and they have 40 different producers on the record. It's your job to figure out how to um, tie it all together as an artist. You know what I mean? Like how to make sure it's all sonically. Because like the albums, the way albums have been made has been changed over the years. Like Rick Rubin kind of invented the modern hip hop album by like taking the rock ethos, like a rock structure, and giving it to like the Beastie Boys and giving it to Run DMC. And that's how you got the traditional structure, you know? And that was kind of like in that vein until like Puffy did like Life After Death. He was the one who invented like I need a West Coast record, I need a girl record, I need a street record, you know what I mean? And that became the new vein, you know what I mean? People started making these regional records, you know what I mean? But then, now it's like how it floats your boat. I think that like 444 it all sounds like one continuous album, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you, it's a, there's a lot of room there for new structures, you know what I mean? I would, people who are into movies, I would do a lot of the movies and try to feel like I would love to see an album that flows like Moonlight. You know what I'm saying? It'll broken up into three parts. You know what I'm saying? That would be a really tight album to me. You know what I'm saying? I would find new ways to approach it because a lot of things that make an album great or a project great isn't the music, it's the skits and the things in between that make it flow. It's when you end the song, when you start the song, the little transitions, you listen to Black Panther 
or uh, damn, it's like all those little words and stuff, and then all that stuff makes it an album. And you know what I'm saying? So that curation process is what gives people experience, and it's a little bit of experience that you're giving somebody a little bit of showmanship, a little bit more, and turns you into like a real artist. I think there's a lot of, I think about it all the time when I watch a movie, like, man, can I like use this pace and this structure for something? You know what I'm saying? Can I use this, this rhythm to make an album? I'm working on three projects right now, and I'm watching movies like nonstop, trying to catch like a scene, trying to catch like a flow that fits. Like, you know, it would be tight if somebody made an album like Quentin Tarantino, you know what I mean? Like hard cuts, you know what I mean? Real choppy, uh, not sequence beginning, start at the end, start at the beginning. But, you know, there's, there's different ways after you make the music. There's a lot of different ways you can do this shit. And, um, you know, I'm just spitting these ideas out. I don't have answers, but it's just things I'll be thinking about that hopefully somebody in this room comes up and does that. You know what I mean? I, I, I think a trick too is like, figuring out the styles of like different directors and seeing if you could use that to structure the flow of not even just your album, like your songs. You know what I mean? Like just the, how your song structures are. You know what I mean? Like one of the work, one of the songs we're working on right now, uh, we're promoting this song called Movamba by Sheck West. And the hook is all through the song. You know what I mean? It's a, like I didn't have to explain it to Travis. It's like it takes too long to drop. You move the drop up. You know what I mean? I'm like, nah, so I have to go show him. Like I was like, look, if you look at Young and Me, the drop comes uh you call it happening? I was like, that comes like a one twenty. You look at a hot nigga by uh Bobby Smurda, you know what I mean? A week ago comes like a 133. Chef West comes at 110. So we're doing good. Like I really had to really break it down and them like that. You know what I'm saying? That the drop it hit different spots. So there's no there's no right way, but there is a way that you need to do it. And it's supposed to be a science behind the music. So if your drop doesn't hit for two minutes, you gotta keep people engaged. You know what I mean? You don't have to do 16 uh, eight bar hook, 16 eight bar hook, four bar bridge. And you're out. It's it's a new world. two parts. The first part, I meant the first part, I didn't mean like back in the day I didn't need a goal. I was saying I wish I did because I think I'd be a lot further along if I had some kind of guidelines of what music and stuff I was trying to make. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, think, I think that everybody should have a niche. And it's tough to have a niche when you're young because you, you, you hear niche like if somebody's trying to limit you. Like, Niche, like I can do everything. I can do pop, I can do rock, I can do everything. Don't try to put me in a box and pop it. <laughs> but the niche, when you get older in life, you realize the niche is actually everything. You know, when you go to the store, the grocery, the niche is what makes somebody head. A niche is what makes this the hip hop, you know, our hip hop archive. You know what I mean? Niche is actually what delivers it. You know, if somebody comes to your door and you need your toilet, your toilet's broken. One guy says, I can fix your sink. You know what I mean? I can clean your house. I can do everything. Second person says, you know, I'm a plumber, you're hiring a plumber. It's the same thing, you need a specialty. As far as me personally, it's like, kind of like, I be thinking about it a lot. So I think at this point, when, after YG's album came out, I started thinking a lot about what I wanted to do in life. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, shit, like, sorry, what I want to do? And I started thinking, like, what's going to be like the illest life I can think of? You know what I'm saying? Like, what? is the coolest life and I thought about it a lot and I was like I want to like travel to like places that like brown people are in power a lot you know what I'm saying I want to go to like Africa and South America and the Caribbean and I want the Car I want those people especially the Caribbean and Africa the Afro Carib to be like have this my role as an option like I was born in Trinidad I was like 17 people in my house when I was born you know what I'm saying like in the village and being an a &R, this 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 room would be nobody because <laughs> don't exist, like it's not even a thing. But it's some of the most creative people in the Caribbean, in Barbados, in Jamaica, and is anybody from Caribbean descent here? 
You know what I'm saying? Like, you know how intelligent, you know what I'm saying, your parents are, but they're not trying to hear that you want to be with some creative shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but I want to change that. I want to be able to go build a school that's like just focused on somebody could be a fashion designer or a, 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 a producer or an engineer, music engineer. Like, that would be cool to have in the Trinidad out of Jamaica. You know what I'm saying? I think you'd probably get some of the best people out. So that's how I ended up here today because I'm still kind of fine-tuning that concept and it's led me to this concept of uh, the creative process and how to make people more creative, like people who get healthy, you know what I mean? And if I can nail it, like in a place like Harvard, I can nail it here, I can just, you guys take whatever, but I'll take it there and I'll try to nail it there. And I feel like I would have done something in my life if somebody could take this method that I'm trying to do and do something like that. Well, somebody in this room emailed me, emailed me and was like, yo, man, everything you told me I did, now I'm straight, <laughs> you know what I mean? That I mean, means I would, you know, my time on earth was meant something, because there's been a lot of A&Rs, there's, there's been a lot of music industry people who've come and go and sold a lot of records, and you know, they have like, the end of their career is just like, oh, he sold, he worked with Stevie Wonder, and he worked with Atlantis Morissette, and now he's dead, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I don't want to be like that, I want to be able to, I want to be able to leave something that somebody could really use and really do. So that's kind of like where I'm trying to end up. So that's I'm real. I'm like 20% there, but I'm, I'm probably like an extra 5% since I've been in Cambridge. Hi, uh, my name is Edgar. I'm a senior at the college. Uh, my question is, do you think the traditional album release cycle is, is dead, um, where you know, you used to roll a couple singles, you'd have an album, you'd tour off of it for a year, you'd go back and make a new record and do it all over again. And people dropping surprise albums or just doing singles, especially a lot of singles on like the pop side of things. Um, do you think it's important now to have just a record? Or, yeah, what do you think? Um, I think one thing is not dead, somebody's gonna put out music and tour. Like, that's not gonna stop. You know what I'm saying? It's like, music tour, music tour. Um, cause you gotta, you gotta perform it when people still wanna hear it, you know? While it's hot. I think like you look at somebody like The Weeknd, he just drops six songs, you know what I'm saying? And get people really into it. And that's his method and he might drop another one, you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't know what he's doing. Or you might have somebody like Drake, who's had a single out in the marketplace for a long time, but it's not promoted like a single, but God plans a single, you know what I'm saying? And then he'll drop an album, maybe drop a date. So if he drops a date and drops an album tomorrow, doesn't mean he didn't have a rollout, or he just didn't announce his rollout. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like still a rollout. It's just all like tricks and, 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 and gimmicks. You know what I'm saying? In my opinion, um, there's no right or wrong way. I don't think you should do surprise album if you like are like still on the come up. You know what I mean? I think if I'm brand new, I'll drop my project and work backwards. You know what I mean? Drop my project, drop how to the video, and it's going to promote when people can discover it. Or if I can, if you're blessed enough to have a song, I have a song. But here's, here's the thing, right? When you're doing your rollout, just know that everything you do is a post. You know what I'm saying? So if you drop a video, it's like dropping an album. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's no difference now. You know what I mean? People take it. Like if you drop a T-shirt, it's like dropping a mixtape. <laughs> it's like dropping a single. So every piece of content that you have, try to stagger it and get the most out of it. Don't you tell when you drop a piece of a t-shirt, please put a lot into that t-shirt because that t-shirt could last you two, three weeks. You know what I'm saying? If you try to drop a single, drop it. Then if you're gonna drop it with the video, then drop the video after, you know what I mean? Just look at everything you have as an asset as far as when you're doing your rollout, when you're on the come up. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have a lot of resources. You can't just be like in the studio every single night like some of these artists. It should be expensive, you know what I'm saying? So you gotta use your assets wisely as, as you roll it out. As far as like the major labels, it's always gonna change. You know what I'm saying? Beyonce drops, you know, Minash is dropping a big roll out. You know what I'm saying? It's like everything's different and everybody's guessing. You know what I mean? Every once in a while somebody will work, but they were guessing. Nobody really knows for sure. You know what I'm saying? I remember J. Cole would always tell his story. He was always like, when he dropped, um, what was that, 2014, Forest Hill Drive? They, you know, a lot, it was like split down the middle on this team. Like some people thought it was genius, and some people thought it was the worst idea you ever did. 
he just said like, you know, he held his breath and just went with it and it ended up working. That could have been a flop. It could have fell flat on his face. But you know what saved him? Music was good. So that's really what it comes down to. Is no matter how you drop it, hidden drops, two weeks, promote it for two months, posters everywhere, just make sure that shit's hot. Do you have any questions for us? Um, I do. Um, cause I, my my goal out of this trip is I'm trying to work out with like type feedback from like those five points. You know what I'm saying? Like I got the goal, the intent, the enlightenment, the flow, and the magic. Right? Which one of those five do you think needs a little bit more clarity? Like needs more like explaining. It was like, it was, it was really funny for the people here like last night. It was goal, intent, enlightenment, flow, and magic. Enlightenment. I'd say flow. That's what I was going to say. It's like, it's so hard to get into it. At yeah. Least, at least for me. You know? mm -hmm. And like, you were like trying to tell us last night like how to do that. There's a lot of points though. Yeah. Yeah. Like concise and like, but it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't think so though. I don't think it's different for everybody. This is the one thing about flow, you can actually get it all in this book. I just don't know how to pronounce the guy's last name. But if you Google flow book, that guy breaks it down the best. For me, I think it's enlightenment. I think it's a little vague. You know what I'm saying? I think that I need to clear that part up a little bit. I'm trying to like nail that part. You know what I'm mean? saying? Homework wasn't my best thing, so I'm trying to like get better at that, you know? Mm -hmm. Could you just go over what each one is in the short description for those? Yeah, just as a reference Okay, so like, remember the five things, right? I don't have a name for the whole thing yet. I'm just still figuring it out. So it's like having a goal is the most important thing. Like, you need to figure out the biggest part of your life. Like, what what would change everything? Like, what is your biggest dream? How does it look? How does it feel? What are you wearing? What clothes are you wearing? What are you doing? Like, you know, what's your big creative goal as a creative? You know what I mean? So you start there. Then you work with your intent. You know what I mean? The intention behind it. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to have that? Why do you want to be that? Is it because you want to be rich? Is it because you want to help the world? Is it because you want to get back at your ex? What's the intent? What's, what's your purpose for doing it? Then it's like the enlightenment. Like now that you know your purpose and you know your intent, like now you're like, okay, cool, I'm clear on what I got to do. What are you sacrificing? You know what I mean? What do you have to get rid of? What do you have to add on? What job do you have to take? What do you have to study? What class do you have to drop? What class do you have to take? Like what do you have to do? What do you, you have to get Pro Tools, you have to become a producer, you have to get more drum kits, you have to intern in a studio. What's helping you get to that point? The fourth is the flow, which starts with the routine. You know what I mean? You get in a routine, you find a spot that you go to every single day. You know what I mean? You give yourself a reward after you finish that song, you finish that beat, do whatever you gotta do. You find a cue that makes you excited. Think about like working out. Like when you hear a certain song, you have a, a gym playlist that gets you hype. You need that for real life and then having a plan to do it four times a week, five times a week, every morning, like whatever that plan is. And then finally, it's the magic. The magic's the final flow. You know what I mean? After you do all that, you get that, that's when the songs start flowing and the sound cloud starts clicking and you start having a team, you get a manager that really likes you and it's like the magic starts to happen. It starts to quantum feel. That's when you start separating yourself from the thing that you're building. You know what I mean? It almost comes to your out-of-body experience. Like, uh, the example I gave last night was uh, Magic Johnson. You know what I mean? Like, Magic becomes Magic because he said he became Magic Johnson based on everything else he was doing. You know what I mean? Based on people, people were treating him. People started calling him Magic. You know, the girls, the car, the Hollywood. It all played into how he made his passes. You know what I'm saying? That mama mentality. Like, Kobe really believes he's a black mamba. Like, you know what I mean? He's like, I'm in there. Like, Prince, like, you know, he goes on. Like, he's like Prince. Like, I'm, I'm just... Just like that, you know what I mean? It's like you have to live through this thing that you create, and almost like um, method acting. You know what I mean? You have to live through this character, and because if you break, then people will see that you broke. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, you don't really believe this shit, but the, the best ones don't break. You know what I'm saying? Like Tupac never broke. He he took it all the way to the end, dog. Like he's like he took it. Like you know what I'm saying? Like. So if you want to be like a legend, you, you gotta you gotta.
be a legend. He can pass the, that, that process. So that's like the five. So what do you, what do you got? Which one? I'm just going to say so. Well, first of all, I do want to say that him having said that, I was thinking, I'm going to mention. But you know, <laughs> so just saying it doesn't make you want. So I just want to make, make that point. But uh, um, um, I, I just want to make sure also uh, when you have a chance if there's something you want to say before I, you know. I, well, actually, um, and you probably have covered this individually meeting people, but you know, for me, um, coming up trying to do production and everything, was really interesting, um, and then getting into the artist side of it was a little harder. What would you say, you know, is to people who start on the path and maybe diverge into something else? And how do you think that experience is transferable and the stuff you do into other areas? Because not everyone's going to become the A&R, not everyone's going to come to become the producer. And I know for me, like I'm going into a different field, and I feel that work informs it. But how could you see your work spilling into other areas? I think you go with what you get the most back out of. You know what I'm saying? So like, if you're like a rapper, but people really love the way that you organize your events and put together your stuff, but they don't love your music, you might be a manager. You know what I'm saying? If you're like a producer and people really love the way that your beats sound, it's very crisp, but you don't like your drums, you might be a mixer. You know what I'm saying? It's just kind of like, Go where your superpower is, but just be honest to what your superpower is. You know, what's everybody has their own superpower and their strengths, but what's your specialty and double down on what you're really, really good at. But it takes a lot of like being real with yourself. You know what I mean? Like when I started what I was doing, I was still a bit of DJ, but I'm not the best DJ. You know what I'm saying? Or like, nah, I'm a DJ, I'm gonna do this. I would just be, you know, making five hundred dollars a night right in New York right now, you know what I'm saying? It'd be bad. You know what I mean? And so like you gotta go, I have to be real with myself, like, okay, cool, I'm really good at putting together projects. I'm really good at working with artists, so maybe, like, I should, this A&R thing is for me. You know what I mean? And now, in my life, I'm getting the most response out of, like, doing stuff like this. You know, I feel like I'm really helping people when I do a podcast or do, like, a panel or like, do this residency. You know, I feel like I'm getting more out of this than damn near even doing the other stuff. But it's a transition, though, for me to get over there, you know? So I gotta, like, work at it, just like, you know what I mean? I'm just like, oh, Speaking now, like, you know, I am, but I gotta still get good, you know? I gotta go two courses, I gotta talk, I gotta do things, I gotta tighten up my plans, I gotta get good, and it's just, a, you know, but I've done it before. I've switched my job title a few times in life that I know, like, I'm gonna be good at it one day. You know what I mean? Like, I know when you come back and hear me talk, like, a few years from now, it's gonna be different. But you just gotta know, you gotta give yourself that time to, to grow and get better. You gotta put the pressure on yourself, but not to get good overnight, you know? Well, I very much want to thank you for, there are many things that, you know, I feel as though we should thank you for. One is just that you kept going and to tell us about that, you know, and as we think about all the times things are happening and we're thinking it's time to stop, but, but you want to keep going and to, to hear how that has worked how you faced things and dealt with it and kept going forward, I think, is a really important uh, message to get out there because there's something about it that is normal and we forget that the struggle and the, the complications are normal and things that we have to get through. And there are other sides of it that are in exceptional because, you know, you really could talk yourself into a room and a position, then so many of us can, but then can you deliver? And I think that the part that you're talking about now is really getting serious with what deliver means and that you have to deliver a whole person, a person who knows what superpower they have and that a person who is going to keep going forward, you know, if not for yourself, than for others, and that, you know, from my perspective, and I think for most of our perspective, it's for the love of hip hop, you know. And um, thank you so much for this. Thanks for having me.
We in this room, we in this room, we all alone. Oh, thank you.